I think that the most exciting biomarker is definitely glucose, just because it's the closest thing uh, that we have to monitor in metabolism, and in a sense, it's the best proxy that we have for insulin. And you see that certain macronutrients actually end up having uh, very interesting effects on, on glucose responses. So for example, fat tends to like kind of like dilute it and stretch it over a longer period of time, the, mm -hmm. the glucose response. So instead of having a spike, you may see it uh, kind of like Prolonged over Prolonged. time. Yeah. Interesting. One particular example I'm fond of is like my uh, my partner uh, one night uh, pulled an all-nighter. We worked really hard. Mm. And the following day we saw all of his glucose responses being amplified significantly. Okay, I'm talking about uh, at least 50% above the normal uh, delta that he mm -hmm. that he had, and then the next night he actually got a good night's sleep, and uh, and you saw the glucose responses going back to what they typically are. Yeah, it's really so amazing. So for him, did that change his lifestyle? Like, oh my gosh, I know we have deadlines, but I should prioritize sleep. To I think that for every one of us, it changed things in the way we perceive our body in, in relation to to food. Hey folks, it's Mike Maltzow here with HighIntensityHealth.com. Today we're going to talk about biometrics and using your own nutrition feedback, your blood glucose monitoring, and to integrate that into individualized dietary recommendations. We're live with Yaron Haddad and he's going to tell you about his app Neutrino. So Yaron, thanks for coming on the show. Thanks a lot for having me. Yaron, let's kind of launch there. You know, some of the data. So Medtronics is a big device company, right, mm -hmm. that you've partnered with. And so they make this 24-hour glucose monitor. Um, I know you can't speak too much about all the details, right? Because it's kind of proprietary, but you've noticed some trends associated with sleep and glucose tolerance and, and so forth. So um, maybe let's let's launch there. Like what is your app doing and how are these different devices like a 24-hour glucose monitoring um, giving data and how does that empower the, the end okay. user there? So we, we create an app called Neutrino or yeah. the Footprint Diet by Neutrino. Uh, we're in the app, uh, the app is focusing on nutrition. People can actually aggregate information and connect to different wearable devices, medical devices, and also uh, DNA data now from 23andMe. Um, there is a whole long list of devices that we plug into, um, including the Medtronic uh, Continuous Glucose Monitor, mm -hmm. um, as well as other, uh, the other glucose monitors in the market that uh, write to HealthKit, Apple HealthKit. And people can use the app to actually discover what we call their footprint, Okay, so they basically, the footprint is the digi digital signature of how food affects individuals' body. It takes into account a whole stream of data, basically anything that we can monitor that helps quantify how food affects people. Um, and by connecting to these devices after you know, a few days using it, they can actually discover how their body responds to different uh, foods. Yeah. So, so you that, look right now at like glucose changes and things like that, but what else would, would someone see? So describe the food print a little bit deeper. Like, do, are people taking pictures of their food or they just put in the input of what they ate? You have a lot of restaurants in there. How does that work? Yeah, so at this stage, what people actually do, the way they interact with the app, they actually log their meals for a certain period of time. Um, there is a whole, there's a huge database of foods going all the way from the spectrum of uh, packaged foods with barcode scanning to restaurants. Um, we created a lot of technology around analyzing all that food data um, and we got to the point in which today we have data of, uh, of the menus of over 250,000 restaurants in the US wow. and it's growing pretty steadily um, and very very quickly and uh, the idea is that they actually log what they're eating at this stage it's not with image uh, recognition although um, we're definitely aiming at making this experience uh, easier yeah. um, and uh, while they do it every time uh, when they are connected to such devices like continuous glucose monitor they can actually see like really see how their metabolism uh, responds to different foods and when they see that uh, one of the nice things is because the data is aggregated from so many different uh, channels uh, they can see the interactions of different um, different components uh, with the way the food is being metabolized in the body mm. So maybe, maybe just some examples to make it uh, uh, less abstract. But uh, for example, I, I'm, I'm using a Fitbit. I can connect my Fitbit uh, into Neutrino together with a continuous glucose monitor. And you can actually see the way uh, physical activity is affecting um, glucose intake. And uh, 
Fitbit in this case and many other devices also monitor sleep. I can give you some, well, I can give many examples of how this affects people, but uh, one, one particular example I'm fond of is like my, uh, my partner uh, one night uh, pulled an all-nighter. We worked really hard. Mm. And the following day, we saw all of his glucose responses being amplified significantly. Okay, I'm talking about uh, at least 50% above the normal uh, delta that, mm -hmm. he, that he had. Um, and then the, the, the next night, he actually got a good night's sleep and, uh, and you saw the glucose responses going back to uh, what they typically are. Yeah, it's really so amazing. That's, that's so just, for him, did that change his lifestyle? Like, oh my gosh, I know we have deadlines, but I should prioritize sleep to... I think that for every one of us, it changed things in the way we perceive our body in, in relation to, to food. Mm -hmm. um, for me personally, um, so I, I'm, a, I'm a vegan, I've been a vegan for 15 years. Um, I discovered that there are certain foods that I really should avoid. Um, so the top three, or you know, the bottom three foods, I guess, um, for me are actually dates where I see huge glucose spikes, all citrus but lemons. Grape, grapefruit is like, uh, you know, can spike my glucose up to like 180, which is wow. very unusual uh, for someone with like a normal A1C. Um, and uh, then the other one is just uh, wheat in general. So all types of, uh, uh, you know, Beer breads, yeah. yeah. Interesting. Pasta. So you're on, you found that out years before the app came out. I mean, not about the citrus and the grapefruit and things like that, but you were telling me offline you had some health issues and so forth and discovered that dairy made a connection. So was that kind of the, the start of the Neutrino app, right? The, your own personal discovery that the diet is so individual. Yeah, so yeah. That, that was really the trigger for me and that's what got me so passionate about nutrition. So um, in, in, in a nutshell, like I, I used to suffer from different health problems, mm -hmm. um, all the way from different sinuses problems to very severe migraines when I was a teenager. Uh, when I was about 16, I read this nutrition book that recommended to try and avoid dairy. Uh, for a lot of people that suffered from similar symptoms. I did so, I was very rigorous about it, and a few weeks after, I actually started feeling better. Hmm. And then this was like a eureka moment, right? Yeah. Like, what just happened? What was that? Just like, you know, I just stopped eating a few things. Yeah. Uh, so I remember going with my dad, who always encourages me to read as much as I can, uh, to the local bookstore, and he basically bought everything on the nutrition bookshelves, every single book. Uh, and I read, I think that until today I probably read like 200 plus books on the topic and uh, you know every book says something completely different, mm -hmm. just completely different and with Neutrino really we try to take this to, to help people discover what works for them on a very personal basis. Uh, for me I went through a whole experience so after that of about three years when I tried to, I tried different diets, I tried 20 plus diets from you know, veganism, vegetarianism, fruitarian, uh, low fat, high fat, all of the above. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, that's what, uh, that's why I decided to be a vegan. That's what works for me best. Um, and with Neutrino, we're really hoping to take this experience that I went through and just make it much shorter and much more sustainable for people. So people can discover their own footprints, how right. food really affects their bodies. Uh, so hopefully they can eat healthier and be healthier. Yeah, I think it's such a, a good point. We were just where we met at a conference, uh, the Personalized Lifestyle Medicine Institute conference. One of the key themes there was the doctor of the future is the patient, right? That mm -hmm. people are, are with all the wearables like your Fitbit and the Neutrino and the other apps, HRV4 training, the heart rate variability that, you know, we have the ability now to monitor our biomarkers and different what you you call like kind of objective markers of health, right? And to see how these different things affect our health because mm -hmm. What we've been doing for a long time is kind of antiquated. The guru says, put butter in your coffee, and I, I personally do that, I think it's great, but it may not work for everyone. Mm -hmm. And I know people that, that that doesn't work for. The guru says, eat breakfast, another guru says, don't eat breakfast. So you're like, what do we do? But now with different devices like Fitbit, 24-hour glucose monitoring, and your app, we can put all the pieces to, of the puzzle together and really compress that learning curve, which is so awesome. Yeah, I agree. I was actually looking yesterday at the New York Times bestsellers on nutrition. And I was just like going through the different uh, books and, and you realize that the vast majority of them uh, actually recommend everybody to eat the same way. Mm. You should all be do that, you should all do that. Uh, which is somewhat, uh, somewhat uh, confusing when you, when you think about this uh, really. It's kind of like I was thinking of, of it as an analogy to someone who's traveling 
and you ask for directions from uh, different locals, mm -hmm. and each one tells you, you should go that way, you should go that way, and, that, and then you ask yourself which one is right. So mm -hmm. uh, in the strict sense, it's obvious that not everybody, all of those diets could work, but then when you actually think about it further, the human body is extremely complex. It's right. much more complex than more, most things that we're trying to understand. There are so many different factors. Uh, and it's, it only makes sense that uh, different people have different responses uh, to foods or to any other kind of um, events or lifestyle uh, related factors. Uh, and and I'm, I'm very happy that we got to the time in which we can finally turn that into a science. Right. Yeah. And have it be accessible on an iPhone and so forth. So, yeah. so that's really great. Um, let's go back a little bit. So what biomarkers tend to shift with food so much? So the 24-hour glucose monitoring, you mentioned blood pressure earlier, and there's other, other biometrics there, sleep. Mm -hmm. What are some of the top ones that are really malleable or influenced uh, plastic, if you will, from dietary shifts? Uh, so there is a whole range of them. I think the, the question should maybe be uh, addressed as like what kind of biomarkers we can actually measure. Uh -huh. uh, because I'm sure that if you'll measure, you know, like the whole set of uh, biomarkers like in the blood, that are related to different, uh, all the way from antioxidants to different micronutrients, you'll discover that uh, most of them vary uh, with relationship to food. The challenge is that we cannot really measure most of them today. So right. this is slowly, sometimes quickly, uh, is actually changing, which is very, very exciting. Um, one, one biomarker that I would love to see a wearable device that actually monitors in, in real time. So there's been uh, uh, some studies, one from, uh, from Berlin where they actually monitored antioxidants in the skin mm. uh, using laser technology. So they basically used a Raman spectro spectroscopy to understand how people's antioxidants uh, change uh, depending on what they do. And you can see that as they are fasting, you can see the antioxidants kind of like starting to alternate, but, but go down and mm -hmm. then you give them a slice of white bread and nothing happens, it keeps going down. And then you give them a, you know, like a cup of uh, green tea and then it wow. just jumps up and uh, that's really, Pretty that's really simple. amazing. Sure. But it's still not something that is available for the masses, right? For, this right. is still research level. So in terms of what we can measure today, I think that the most exciting, uh, Parameter. The most exciting biomarker is definitely glucose, just because it's the closest thing uh, that we have to monitor in metabolism, and in a sense, it's the best proxy that we have for insulin, mm -hmm. uh, which is, uh, I think, would have been amazing if we could actually measure continuously. Uh, there's been quite a few companies working uh, around making uh, continuous blood pressure monitors, and that definitely changes with food and with other activities, and that's an amazing mm -hmm. biomarker everything else that may interact with metabolism so basic basically sleep physical activity uh, like so pulse on. ox i know there's pulse ox resting heart rate are those other things that kind of at this point feed into the app or yeah that's kind of we we are we are using them in the app not all of them have the same effect obviously uh, when it comes to influence on metabolism mm -hmm. uh, but basically in terms of the of the list of data streams that are flowing uh, into the app into uh, the footprint are things all the way from physical activity we connect to over a dozen different wearable devices, uh, sleep, um, DNA data from 23andMe, and hopefully there will be others that we will plug into soon, medical records, um, and uh, glucose data I mentioned, data from, from insulin pumps for people that actually use them, oh, so cool. mostly patients that uh, are dosing insulin, typically people with type 1 diabetes. Uh, and hopefully very soon also th stuff like gut. Uh, yeah, I was going to ask you the microbiome Microbiome, stuff. yeah. So that would be down the road that would really get in there, which would be neat. You mentioned 23andMe and genomics. I would love mm -hmm. to tackle that, but let's kind of finish off the glucose because another when we first met, one of the questions that I asked you because I've been following the circadian rhythm research for a while and we know that we get more insulin resistant as the day goes on. So I was wondering if there was a circadian oscillation that you see uh, and working with Medtronics and so forth with 24-hour uh, glucose. Do you see that where glucose tends to rise at night? So yeah, most definitely. So yeah. actually the models that we use, so we, we create models that help people predict those footprints. So mm -hmm. uh, as one of the consequence of that is actually predicting glucose responses based on historical glucose responses and, and the different events that might have triggered them, okay? 
Um, so uh, these models that we're working are actually very sensitive to the time of day and you can actually see very different responses. So when people wake up in the morning, the responses tend to be very different. As the day goes by, the, the, the delta between the time they wake up until the time they ate the meal is actually something that is very important for these models, otherwise they really? don't really work. Huh. Um, and why is that? Basically it has to do with circadian uh, rhythms and, and microbiome. So there's been, um, and uh, I can tell you from the data, well, from uh, the point of view of data analytics at least, that mm -hmm. uh, I'm not the one doing these studies on microbiome. There have been some amazing, amazing uh, clinical trials that have been done over the last uh, three to five years. Uh, but uh, I mean, scientists already explored different relationships and noticed that if you take, uh, for example, mice and you uh, change their microbiome, you can see that that actually affects their circadian ry rhythms and vice versa. Mm -hmm. If you change your, their diet, the diet also has a very close relationship to the microbiome as, uh, as you've seen when you uh, talk to Jeff uh, Leach yeah. um, and vice versa. So all of these parameters are very intertwined and it's very, very complex. Uh, just being able to explore any of these properties and relationships is, is, is hard, but mm. fascinating. Yeah. Like you learn so many things. Sure. Um, so Really interesting. But, but again, to underscore the importance of what you said there. So the, the delta, so the, the change mm -hmm. from when you wake up to the first meal, that is significant for the rest of the day's glucose Correct. regulation. Interesting. Yeah. So the, the, the later during the day, it is mm -hmm. typi typically, okay, it's always important to emphasize, yeah. always typically, uh, it's very difficult to find patterns that are completely re repetitive in every single person, but typically the glucose response also uh, increases, amplifies. Mm. Yeah. yeah, really interesting. And then yeah. so uh, <laughs> if you were to work late at night and, and you know, not adhere to your circadian rhythms and go to sleep uh, at the right times, then what we would see is everything's amplified is what you're saying. So the morning, maybe your fasting baseline is 75, it would be maybe 95 or 85 something, yeah. and then it would progressively get higher. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then if you eat late at night, you can also sometimes see the effect of that on your glucose levels uh, while you're asleep. Oh, that's something I never thought about. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about that earlier, but uh, thanks for bringing it up. So how do people that are insulin resistant, how do their blood sugar, um, does it spike while they're sleeping periodically? Is there like a cycle there or? Uh, so yeah, so sometimes it depending on the time in which you actually had the meal, it also obviously depends on the composition of the meal and the level of the sensitivity. Most of our work and definitely the work that we've done with Medtronic mm. um, is around uh, people that are actually using also an insulin pump. So the vast majority of them are actually uh, people that have type one mm. uh, diabetes, uh, but there are some with type twos and also other populations that we, we explore that uh, you can see these uh, patterns in. It's really yeah, interesting. Really interesting, yeah. You know, because a lot of the circadian rhythm research shows that we actually burn fat while we're sleeping. So I would, my intuition would be that the glucose would be lower because mm. we are in kind of more of a ketogenic, the mitochondria are really active. Again, it depends on your circadian rhythm and metabolic health and so forth, but I was just kind of interested mm. in that. So um, Medtronic, uh, what sort of conversations have you had with them in terms of so they're getting all this like circadian rhythm based data on the glucose. Are they then suggesting medications be used at different times commensurate with someone's baseline levels? Because right now the standard approach, you know, is like, oh yeah, just take your metformin like mm -hmm. two, you know, 500 milligrams twice a day. You know, doctors are not really, you know, aligning medication with biological rhythms, at least the non-progressive integrative functional medicine doctors. So are you seeing that as a trend through metformin? So, yeah, so uh, th there is like a limit on how much I can talk. I, I definitely cannot represent Medtronic. This kind of things so yeah. I should probably ask them. But um, in general, what Medtronic has done was uh, they're uh, releasing it, something they announced officially. I'm not uh, uh, telling anything that is a secret, but uh, an app called Sugar IQ uh, that is py powered by Watson, uh, as well as uh, our uh, Neutrino footprint uh, insight platform. Um, where uh, people that have a Medtronic continuous glucose monitor basically can explore uh, their footprints or how different foods affect them, learn about their body, um, and then hopefully adjust uh, to basically improve and manage your glucose levels better. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's, that's, the, that's the core of it. Um, this is obviously just because we were talking about people that are mostly mostly using uh, an insulin pump, not exclusively, but most of most of uh, most of these uh, individuals. 
uh, then it's highly regulated. You cannot uh, recommend uh, anything you would you might want to right. recommend. Just uh, the FDA is trying to make sure people are healthy and uh, not do anything that might harm them. Mm -hmm. And because insulin is such a in, insulin is a very dangerous drug, yes, uh, yeah. it has to be heavily regulated. Right. So, so yeah, it's, it sounds like their focus is more on the type one diabetic side. Is from what I gather via the twenty four hour. I mean, obviously, I think for me personally, let, let me say that yeah. I, I would love to see continuous glucose monitors and just the whole concept of being able to monitor your metabolism, which is mm -hmm. something that is so powerful, uh, going all the way from type 1s to type 2s and to people that are living with prediabetes and no. all the way to healthy people like you and, yeah. and, and others. And, and uh, I, I believe it will get there in just a matter of time, right? Right. Yeah, exactly. Are they very expensive, the devices? Uh, so it ranges. Um, right now, they're being reimbursed for people who um, actually uh, need to dose insulin. Um, but uh, the price tag of this device also tends to go down right now. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's getting lower and lower over time. Yeah, but they're, they're labeled um, as uh, for usage only for people who are living with diabetes. Mm -hmm. That's, uh, Interesting. That's important. So not everyone can just buy them on, off the shelf. Right. So go to your integrated functional medicine doctor. Say you want to monitor your blood glucose and, and try. Try the best you can, right? To I, get out. I don't know. I, yeah. I, You're on that that's beyond what I can answer. <laughs> right, right. Um, but yeah, we when we initially thought about this and started this, we we're like, okay, everybody should have it. They should yeah. sell it in stores, but you know, they're regulated. And mm -hmm. it's going to take some time until it uh, goes that way. That way. Yeah. yeah. But uh, when you hear like people discuss this uh, just online and, and even some of the ex executives in these companies uh, in their public releases, you understand that there is a trend and they would love to expand it to, um, to others. Mm -hmm. I think that it's one of the most fascinating biomarkers you can look at. Oh, it's amazing. Well, yeah, it's I mean, probably like the second most interesting biomarker. Right, what's the first? Probably insulin. Oh, okay. And then antioxidants also like on the top three. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like you say, grapefruits and then citrus. And there's a few others that were like, they're so, I mean, the correlation there between those different, you know, are, there's no one would have guessed, right? And people yeah. think, oh, grapefruit. Yeah, it's great in fiber, antioxidants and so on. And there is very, there are a lot of very interesting nonlinear effects. So if you eat, so uh, that's something that I guess it's not very surprising. But if you eat meal A and you see the response and then you eat, meal B, even if it's like a completely new day after you fasted and you see the response and then the next day you're eating A plus B, the response is not going to be the response of A plus the response of B. Wow. It's going to be different. And you see that certain um, macronutrients actually end up having uh, very interesting effects on, on glucose uh, responses. So for example, fat tends to like kind of like dilute it and stretch it over a longer period of time, the, mm -hmm. the glucose response. So instead of having a spike, you may see it uh, kind of like Prolonged over Prolonged, time. Yeah. Interesting. So, uh, yeah, I was going to ask you about ketosis and kind of your meeting that you had with Peter Atia, and he calls, I think, the food GPS. Is that the, the food print? He has a different name for it. <laughs> we, we have one of the features in our app is what we call, uh, well, I, I, I call it the eat out feature, mm -hmm. which is basically, so just like an important stat before I mentioned that, today it's estimated that more than half of the meals in the U.S. are actually eaten out. So we wanted to address it because we know part of the problem is just the availability of healthy foods or foods that are, re that are relevant and are right for you as an individual. Um, so we created a system of bots that practically do what Google does to the whole World Wide Web, just to menus of restaurants. So they crawl through menus of restaurants, analyze them, uh, understand what they're composed of, what kind of dietary needs might be related to them, what kind of nutritional composition they might have, aggregate them, uh, today we're at about 250,000 uh, restaurant locations, a little bit more than that. Um, and, uh, and the app is actually capable of providing you with personalized uh, menus from restaurants based on that. Wow. So Peter Atia calls it the food GPS. I kind of right. like that. Yeah. <laughs> so, so let's say we're, we're going to go out to dinner in San Francisco and you know, you're avoiding gluten, so am I. Uh, I, but I want to be ketogenic or whatever, for example. So we can like search ketogenic San Francisco and it will pop up or it, it knows that I like do better on fat anyway, like tell me the intelligence there. So basically what goes in for the personalization part is a whole set of parameters. It's actually very long, but you can go as deeply as you want with it. 
So you can set your own uh, taste profile. These are the kind of foods I like. These are the kind of foods I don't like. You can set uh, dietary needs, you know, from a whole very long list of dietary needs and, and food allergies. Right now we're supporting over 45 different dietary needs and allergies, mm. including all the big ones. Um, you can also set things like uh, costume ranges of different nutrients. So you can say, I want to eat, I don't know, 45% carbs from my diet and 25% uh, fat and the rest, uh, yeah, being whatever, protein. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, the app will actually, so our engine in the background is actually taking that information into account and that's how this eat out feature, the, that food GPS, if yeah. you wish, um, finds dishes that are relevant for you. So it takes into account your taste and what you ate before during that day and whether you worked out or not um, and all of those other personalization parameters that I mentioned to, to help you eat better. Interesting. And find things that are relevant for you. Right? Yeah, so I want to pick up, so whether or not you worked out affects your macronutrient needs. So Correct. is that skewing towards more carbohydrate if you did work out? Or? So that depends on your health goal. So one of the things that you set up, and I forgot to mention it before, you can set up your own uh, individual health goal in the app. Mm. Uh, so that can be different things all the way from, you know, gaining muscle mass to managing glucose be uh, levels better to losing weight or, uh, and then it can, it can vary in terms of, the effect of physical activity on, uh, on uh, the recommendations. Really interesting. Um, and uh, one, one of the things that we are doing, we, we're trying to expand now um, the eat out uh, capabilities around specific locations. So there are certain zip codes in the country uh, and certain cities that we have like 80% coverage basically of restaurants. So 80% of the restaurants in a certain zip code are going to be mapped and are going to be available on the app. Uh, and over the next uh, two, three months, we're going to expand that significantly to many other locations. So it mm -hmm. would be lovely to get feedback from also from your audience to see what kind of locations they're, they would like to see mapped out uh, so we can, we can also help them get yeah. better. That's really, I mean, I really like where this is going because it's sometimes we, um, that whole 80-20 rule, mm -hmm. right, where we kind of like, eat like 80% of the time we go out to dinner, we go to the same 20 restaurants or the 20% of the restaurants that we've ever been to in a certain mm -hmm. area. So we get in this habit of things. And if we knew that that restaurant or the food choices on the restaurant that are our favorites are affecting our blood sugar in a negative way, our sleep, everything else, where they're incompatible with our genome, which we'll talk about, then we can make better lifestyle choices because people get into a rut and they do the same thing over and over again, right? And so I, I really like where this, easier. <laughs> this is going, yeah. Um, Curious, so what did Peter Atia say about, because I know he's really big into the manipulating carbohydrates and fat and so forth. Did you guys have any conversations about fatty acid metabolism and or carbohydrate restriction? A little, a little bit less. Uh, like we discussed a lot of other things, but uh, that wasn't something we, we focus on on yeah. our conversation. Okay. Uh, to kind of wrap up the macronutrients, you were saying that fat makes everything a little bit delayed. So there's not gonna be as much uh, valleys and troughs with glucose, but... So yeah, so typically from what we observed, and again, it's typically, uh, you actually see the effect when, when people consume extra fat in a meal, you actually see the uh, glucose responses being kind of like prolonged um, over a longer period of time, uh, where typically the, the max, like the, the actual delta, tends to be a little bit uh, higher. So the, the maximum of the glucose uh, response. So that was something that was really, really cool to observe. That is really interesting. And so the high fat, low carb diets are really hot right now. There's mm -hmm. a lot of new research on, on, on ketone bodies, how they affect metabolism and genomic yep. function. Um, so it's not a one size fits all, right? How many people have you found with genomic 23andMe and then your 24 hour testing and so forth? actually is that compatible for, like that diet is recommended for? So we, so far, I, I have to, uh, to speak transparently, so far the genomic is something we just plugged into about a couple of months ago. Mm -hmm. And typically in, in general, in terms of our um, uh, data, when, whenever we wanna add a new input, the first thing we do, we just let people you know, connect to it, plug mm -hmm. to it. We see what kind of data we collect and what we can potentially do with it. And then we adapt the system uh, accordingly to actually help uh, those kind of individuals uh, eat better. Uh, another thing I should mention regarding that, just so people are not worried, I know uh, today data privacy is a very big issue. Mm -hmm. Everything that we're doing is obviously HIPAA compliant, anonymous. We're, we're trying to yeah, do, do things the right way. So yeah. now regarding your question, so 
about okay. fat and, and how many people that you found is the ketogenic diet actually working for them in a favorable way and lowering glucose and so forth? Yeah, so in general, we did notice an, an obvious trend that is not surprising uh, between uh, the amount of uh, carbs in the diet to, to the glucose responses. So basically, if you actually look at all the nutrients in the food and try to find the one best predictor for the glucose response, uh, it's not going to be the ideal predictor because it's obviously insufficient, uh, but it's obvious the, the, that predictor is carbs. Mm -hmm. So as people eat less carbs, they typically have a much smaller glucose response. That's something that is not surprising and has been studied pretty, uh, pretty intensively in the, liter in the literature. Yeah. Right? So. It seems to me that for an individual like you, Iran, where you have a, a grapefruit or a seemingly mm -hmm. healthy food and it paradoxically spikes your blood sugar, it, it may not be the glucose components within the food. It may be more like the allergenicity, some sort of cross reactive of protein, a pesticide associated with that particular fruit, right? Yeah. So I'm wondering if there's any contaminated fat sources, like maybe walnuts would have a paradoxical spike on someone's blood sugar. For example, have you found any obscure situations like that? I see. So I, I, I definitely cannot necessarily associate the kind of uh, weird responses that we observed with uh, you know, specific allergens, potential allergens in food. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's very difficult to make that leap uh, in analysis and, and be able to say that was the cause of something. We did observe, though, that uh, certain foods tend to be surprising in the response sometime. Um, like, uh, for example, I, maybe just an example for myself, just uh, mangoes, okay? Mm -hmm. A lot of sugar, right? A lot of fructose and uh, mostly carbs, uh, some fiber. Uh, mangoes almost don't affect my glucose levels. So I can wow. sometime, one time I even did this experiment, uh, two days, two consecutive days. The first morning I, uh, I made like a fresh uh, orange juice that I, that I drank, uh, spiked my glucose to about 165, okay? Then out of, uh, I was, uh, I think I was like at 78 at baseline. The next day, again, after fasting, I just woke up. I wanted to get rid of the fiber in the mango to see how the mango juice by itself affects me. So mm -hmm. I put a mango, a, like a three mangoes in a juicer, made a cup of mango juice, drank it, drank it straight up the way, the way it was, just the same way I drank oh, the geez. orange juice. And um, my, my glucose spiked to like 117 or something that is like surprisingly low considering the amount of uh, fructose that I just com consumed. Mm -hmm. Uh, so really interesting. Yeah, and, and there, there's been some studies uh, around the relationship between that and, uh, and uh, microbiome, uh, particularly one study that came out of, also out, came out of Israel where they created a, uh, an algorithm for predicting glucose responses uh, to some extent from people's microbiome. So it seems like food or people's diet affects their microbiome, uh, microbiome affects glucose responses and then you get like this whole highly complex system of many parameters that are just like intertwined mm -hmm. maybe even more complicated than the kind of stuff I did in my <laughs> dissertation in physics you know Is it's like right? when you actually try to look at uh, um, the, the human body yeah, really, really interesting. So basically what you're referring to is that the microbiome is the interface between us and the environment, right? And so that postprandial response is not so predictable based upon like its known glycemic index, right? Mm -hmm. that, that a lot of foods have. So if you, oh, the glycemic index of white bread is 100 or whatever, but what we're saying is it really is contingent upon your microbiome health and that's so individual and that's why, you know, you're looking at, at the individuality of it. Yeah, so the glycemic index, it's not that it's in any way, it's not that it's useless, right? It's just the best proxy that you have on a general population mm -hmm. uh, for people's glucose responses. But uh, once you actually take each individual by herself or himself, you understand that there can be quite big variations for, from the glycemic index. Yeah. And that's where it's so powerful. Um, we know that... Um, microbiome is not going to be available for just everybody. So we actually use the historical responses, the historical glucose responses to predict the future glucose responses. Mm -hmm. Really love that. You know, if you were to ask a hundred doctors, integrative functional medicine doctors, what's gonna affect my blood sugar more? You know, mango juice wrap or orange juice, most people would say mango juice for sure, because it, it's, oh. yeah, I think so. Um, you know, there's pulp and other phytonutrients and fiber components within like a whole orange juice. So. I love dried mango, so I'm, I'm curious to see how they, uh, <laughs> it's one of my vices actually, just that it just, they taste absolutely amazing. 
Yeah. Uh, so let's kind of shift gears a little bit, Iran, to uh, the genomic testing. So 23andMe, I know you said you recently kind of integrated that. Um, any trends that you've found so far, and then what are you looking for in the future, and how can that kind of weave into this whole picture? It's still preliminary for us to, to say anything mm -hmm. about this. We just recently integrated with it. Um, mm -hmm. I do know that there is a lot of, uh, a lot of literature on, um, on uh, basically on, on genetics and the relationship, well, nutrigenomics, mm -hmm. and specifically the relationship to metabolism of certain nutrients like uh, folate and folic acid, and we will get into it, but at this stage we're still still not there. Mm -hmm. So people can put their raw data in there and combine it with 24-hour hour glucose monitoring, mm -hmm. the food diary and so forth, and then you can make suggestions like eat exactly. more broccoli, like you mentioned, if you have MTHFR and so forth, yeah, exactly. which is really powerful. Yeah, because some of the data suggestions are, are not so specific uh, mm -hmm. from the testing companies, right? Mm -hmm. It's really cool stuff. I have a few final questions for you, Ron, but uh, anything about individualized medicine, uh, by wearables, technology, empowering you know end users, right, to uh, take charge of their health, anything that we didn't get to talk about that you want to share? Um, I think that for me, one of the most exciting new parameters that, are, that we are intending on integrating into the system, that's something we didn't really get to mention much, is uh, heart rate variability. Mm -hmm. uh, so you mentioned before Marco Altini and his work on HRV for training. Um, it's a wonderful app and we, we would love to integrate with heart rate variability both on the discrete level like uh, with Marco's app uh, and also on the continuous level. So there, is, uh, there are different products on the market right now. Yeah. They're a little bit less consumerized but that can provide amazing insights uh, as to people's uh, stress levels and, and quality of sleep uh, using this idea of heart rate variability. So mm -hmm. that's for me is one of the, the exciting ones. That will be really awesome. Yeah, and yeah. it's non-invasive, right? I mean, the idea of measuring your blood sugar 24 hours a day is really awesome, but it's a, you told me it does, it's not painful, right? The little stick. It's not. But yeah, the, the HRV is really non-invasive, which is really nice. And interestingly, I've noticed just anecdotally for myself, it changes a lot with exercise, with sleep, and uh, with diet. So the ketogenic diet tends to have a high, have impart more mm. heart rate variability, which is pretty unique. And that's so individual. So that would be really exciting. That would be um, amazing. Then in general, one of the things that we did integrate with and that you can do a lot with when it comes to nutrition is obviously blood tests. It doesn't have to be continuous. Uh, but if you see someone has a, you know, low iron levels in the blood, you can address that with diet, uh, typically very easily. And you know, nutrition is, is related to just everything. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, so that's, that's another input. It's not a wearable device, maybe one day, but uh, that's another <laughs> fascinating data stream. Yeah, yeah. At the conference that we were at, there was a uh, mention of a kind of a blood spot test that mm -hmm. will look at all the proteomic metabolites, metabolome, and the Chem24, like everything all in one and a little. So that's, I think, getting there. We're getting results faster and faster now, which is pretty cool. Yeah. Um, so being here in the Tech Hub, Silicon Valley, you know, San Francisco, any devices, wearables, technology that we should be aware about that you're particularly excited about? Uh, I think that in general, if you look at the whole spectrum of companies, all the way from the big giants in Silicon Valley to a lot of startups, there is a lot of, uh, a lot of motion in the direction of uh, the wearable uh, scene. Um, I won't mention any specific names, uh, but I do know that there will be very interesting uh, advancements uh, over the next 12 months with wearable devices. Okay. So we'll be on the lookout for that. We'll be excited <laughs> about it. Yeah. I'm just looking for any new ways of uh, monitoring my, my physiological parameters. It's, it's amazing. Yeah. It's now, uh, as a physicist, <laughs> right, so you, you have your uh, graduate degree and doctoral thesis, right, in, in physics. Mm -hmm. So you understand. Uh, Bluetooth and, and EMS and so forth. What's a realistic concern there? Like you're wearing your Fitbit, there's Apple Watches. I mean, how, how is that affecting our biological health and uh, should we be concerned? That's, a, that's a, one of the most delicate questions you can, uh, you can ask. Um, I know that the companies that do produce these devices are obviously being um, regulated quite heavily in terms of uh, the kind of uh, the spectrum of radiations that you can use and over uh, what periods of times. Um, I'm particularly, I'm, I'm not particularly worried about this. No. Uh, in general, I, I try not to, you know, uh, be, well, stick the phone next to my head for mm -hmm. several hours talking on the phone with my colleagues in, in Tel Aviv. Um, but uh, I, I think that 
that, that will be fine. <laughs> yeah, so you're not too concerned. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Well, uh, as we kind of part ways here, I have a few final questions that we ask every guest on the show you run. And the first one is your morning routine. So we, I know you're managing a team of 17 coders and developers in Tel Aviv. You're a busy guy, you have your, your doctorate in physics and so forth. Um, what do the first couple hours of your day look like? So I just recently moved here about a month ago and it's, you know, we've been uh, adapting to the new, uh, new lifestyle, uh, especially with the, with the time difference, difference in time zones uh, with the rest of my team. Um, but basically, typically what I do is uh, I wake up, I do yoga in the morning for about half an hour, have a breakfast, um, you know, take a shower and go to work. That's my typical routine. I do most of my exercise at night. Uh, since I got here, been slacking a little bit with the yoga and it's also been very uh, hard because of the time zone difference. Uh, yeah. So uh, sometimes I just jump directly to phone calls starting like at, uh, you know, 7 a.m. Uh -huh. um, but still trying to adapt uh, to the new, uh, new location, the time difference, basically. So when you wake up like 7 Pacific Standard, we're, we're in San Francisco, so what time is it in Tel Aviv? So lately I've been waking up at 6.30 a.m. Uh, in Tel Aviv, uh, that is uh, 4, yeah, that is uh, 4.30 uh, mm -hmm. p.m. Mm -hmm. Try to do yoga for about half an hour, have a breakfast, and then jump on calls with my team and, and other partners for about a couple of hours. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I spend most of my day uh, around, uh, well, the data analytics that we're doing and the actual research that we're doing. Uh, in order to provide people with better insights uh, and better analysis of food. That's also something that we, we spend quite a lot of time working on. Uh, and then uh, typically my evenings are my workout time. So mm -hmm. uh, in the evening, I typically go running uh, for an hour or so. Uh, cool. Yeah. I was curious about the time zone difference because um, your, your team is ending their day. So you want to catch, there's a drive there to catch up with them and see yeah. what they figured out, right? But the other part of you wants to do yoga and calm down and get the, set Correct. the day right. So how do you kind of balance that? I mean, mentally, I guess it depends every day is <laughs> differently, right? But part yeah. of you just wants to like, wait, 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 but you're curious, right? So any tips there for people? Because this is a realistic concern for a lot so of people. I, so I think that one of the things that worked best for me, and uh, that's one of the things that I'm trying to really uh, uh, stick as part of my routine, uh, more more rigorously is to actually have a, a pretty uh, set up routine in advance so all of the meetings have them you know put together over a period of a couple of hours and uh, have like a fixed time for the yoga mm -hmm. just so uh, you get into that routine of doing that and uh, and uh, then it's easier to actually maintain those those habits yeah, so it's yeah. very consistent. Yeah. So it's on the books, the yoga mat's out, you know you're doing that, you're not gonna be tempted to check the email, because once you start, it's, yeah. there's no going back, right? That's what I do too, is put it out at night, and, when, and once you start getting in the habit, it's easy to continue that, and yeah. if you're just whimsical about it. Um, Although for me, I, I've always been like actually a night person, so mm -hmm. typically, most of my life, until just like the last uh, few weeks since I moved here, I've been actually kind of like the opposite, I've been, uh, Waking up relatively later and going to sleep at about uh, 4 a.m. Oh, really? Day. Yeah, I've been like a night owl pretty much. Mm -hmm. Either programming or reading or doing research, stuff like that. Uh, just find myself more productive at night. Mm -hmm. And that didn't affect your biological, or sorry, your blood sugar regulation because you were consistent with that. I was consistent with, consistent mm -hmm. with that over a period of uh, many years. Wow. Uh, just like pretty recently with all the traveling and meetings here and meetings there and flying around uh -huh. uh, that it's been changing, but... Uh, Interesting. Yeah. So there's a whole chronotype, you know, that's coming out where d different yep. people you know, I'm definitely a night person. Yeah. I can tell you that. <laughs> yeah, that's really interesting. <laughs> uh, so let's talk about a favorite nutrient that you just swear by. So you're going to be you're on stranded on a desert island. Vitamin D, omega threes are covered. There's okay. one thing that you need to bring with you because it's so great for your health. What would that be and why? Wow, that's a very very good question. Never thought about this one. Um, so you said the omegas are covered. Yeah. It's actually not going to be a, a micronutrient. It's going to be a macronutrient. Cool. And I would say that my favorite would be fiber for sure. Yeah. I eat about uh, 50 plus grams of fiber a day, which is tons. Yes. Yeah, kind of like a rhino. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it's already pretty much well studied and researched that how, uh, what kind of beneficial effects it has on your microbiome. Uh, definitely can see it in terms of uh, um, 
you know, people's metabolism responses to glucose even in the in the long term, not in the short term. Mm -hmm. uh, interestingly enough, uh, meaning that it may be affecting the microbiome over time. Is that what yep. you're saying? Okay, yep. love that. that that's a yeah. huge point that that you just brought out there right there. So for me, definitely fiber. Fiber. I just take some kale and uh, yeah. other veggies and leeks. Are so if you had to pick like your top gut microbiome fiber boosting foods, what would leeks, onions to share with you? Mm, that's a tough one. Uh, broccoli, mm. I love broccoli, kale, mm. spinach. Yeah. Those, those would be probably the top three in terms of, uh, of uh, vegetables. Mm -hmm. Gar guessing. Garlic, it's not uh, strong for the, specifically for the fiber, but I, just su such an amazing add-on. Yeah. There, there is so much uh, research around how beneficial it is. Right, right. Uh, it's just hard to be social all the time if you're doing a bunch of garlic, right? But yeah, yeah, really awesome. So if, if you were to bump <laughs> shoulders with someone from the World Health Organization, President of the United States, uh, what health or uh, wearable technology type tip would you want them to know about if you were to bump shoulders with them in an elevator? Oh, wow, you picked up all the <laughs> really good ones. You thought about yeah. this before. It's the same. We've done it 165 <laughs> times, yeah. Uh, specifically around wearables though. Oh, just if, just a lifestyle or health tip that you would want them to understand and know about that maybe they could, you know, have on the back burner and influence policy around. I would actually say that the number one, uh, the, the, the number one factor in terms of what people are eating is their environment probably um, and just the availability of food. And I'm actually in the process of writing a blog post. I even thought of turning it into an article where I did an analysis of our, all of the coverage that we have for uh, restaurants that in particular includes every chain that you can think in the US and uh, the correlation between the density of the of specific uh, uh, type of restaurants and specific types of dishes mm -hmm. with data from the CDC. Uh, and the correlations are quite, quite amazing. I'm not going to reveal anything yet because mm -hmm. I haven't uh, finished it. Yeah. Um, but I would say that definitely availability of food and I would love to see uh, you know people in, in the administration trying to encourage really more in the in the sense of encouraging and not necessarily penalizing yeah. uh, but like encouraging uh, healthier places to or any place to just serve healthier foods big time so basically to summarize kind of messages from the podcast is more than 50 percent of the meals that people are eating are eating out at restaurants and Correct. what you're Correlating is higher prevalence of obesity and diabetes and so forth with limited availability of healthier restaurant choices. Yeah. And that's why we see like on the coastal regions, New York and, you know, California and Washington, we see like all these organic farm to table options. But you go towards the middle of the country or the south, it's Outback Steakhouses and mm -hmm. the IHOPs and all the chains that don't offer healthier food. So yep. love that. Love that tip. And what's really cool about this whole kind of movement towards health is there's so many more restaurants that are emphasizing organic cool. farm-to-table non-gmo yeah. which is really really cool it's uh, it's been improving a lot over the last uh, few years and i think uh, we're just like at the pretty Tip much at it. the beginning of a of a revolution yeah it's really exciting for sure <laughs> so you ron haddad really appreciate you coming on the show if folks want to learn more about the app tell them uh, the website and how to find more info yeah so our website is uh, www.neutrino dot co so neutrino is spelled n-u-t-r-i-n-o dot co they can also look in the app store for neutrino or the footprint and they will find more information about us i also have a blog which is just my name dot com so your own hadad dot com okay. uh, we also write sometimes about uh, nutrition and other things like physics cool. uh, yeah, and uh, would love to get feedback from people. There is uh, a long way to go, and we're very excited about uh, what we're cooking for, for everybody. It's awesome. Yeah. yeah, I'm excited. I'm glad we had this conversation. It's been awesome to chat with you. And, and folks listening, if you want to check out those websites, just click the, the, link, the link below this video. And if you like the video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe. Yaron, really appreciate you coming on the show. Thank you. Thanks a lot.